Sonic, the heart of your system. Hi and welcome back to a new video. I recently visited my parents in the south area of Germany where I'm originally from and where I still store a lot of my old hardware stuff I've been using for, I don't know, like 15 years or even longer ago. And I was going through some my very, very old stuff and I found this one. It's a CPU cooling unit from SwiftTech. It's called the MCX 4000 T. And this is a Peltier or Tech cooler from the year 2001 and it has been sitting in its box for many many years and I've never used this before. And when I was just going through my collection I thought maybe it's finally time to try this thing and see how this could perform on a recent Ryzen 3000 CPU. Obviously back then in 2001 Ryzen 3000 or socket AM4 was not available. This one was made for the first Pentium 4 completely different socket which will make it a little bit more complex. We will have to make our own mounting to kind of fit this cooling unit onto the socket AM4 but that's what we're going to try in today's video. SwiftTech was really really successful with CPU cooling blocks in the late 90s. They had the MC370 cooling unit which was a very simple cooling unit. It was a solid aluminium base plate and then they basically had aluminium rods punched into the aluminium base plate therefore creating a lot of surface area and typically using a 60 millimeter fan on top. Back then CPUs didn't really have that high power consumption therefore this would really work out well. Then one or two years later they had the MC1000 and MC2000 cooling units which were for slot 1. Again Pentium 3 area but this time for slot, uh, slot 1 where the CPUs were soldered on this slot card. It's basically a PCB and therefore the CPU was plugged into the mainboard on a PCB and then they attached the cooling units to it. The MC1000 was featuring a single tech and using two 60mm fans and then there was a bigger version that was the MC2000 which was using quad 60 millimeter fans and two techs in total and I think there's still a review of that unit online on Anatech and I think they managed to overclock some Pentium 3 CPUs and with idle temperatures of about minus 3 minus 4 degrees Celsius which really was a lot back then and which really sounds some fun especially considering that this was like 20 years ago. The MCX 4000T is not that much different when it comes to the cooler design. We still have this massive copper plate on the bottom this time they were using copper instead of aluminium but they were still using some solid aluminium rods and they basically look like threaded rods. They plugged or threaded into this base plate for increasing the surface area and dissipating the heat. They increased the fan size. I think this was one of the first CPU cooling blocks that were using or supporting 92 millimeter fans. There was also a version of the MCX 4000 without T. The T was for the tech that's built inside the base plate, but the version um, without T was not using a tech cooling unit and was a simple CPU cooler. Talking about the MCX 4000T, I'm not really sure what type of tech they built in, what the power capability of this tech is, but design wise it's a quite interesting cooling unit. As I said before we have this massive copper base and then we have a tech built in and another piece of copper right here. Everything is surrounded by some foam for insulation which is really cool that it's built in insulation and back then this was designed for the first Pentium 4 which was socket 478 and 478 was also a PGA socket similar to what we have on AM4 so a pin grid array and they have this foam stencil right here which really looks like it would also fit on AM4 PGA socket and I think that's what we're going to try if we can somehow fit this cooler onto this motherboard because as I said before socket 478 I will have to think of how I can adjust this mounting from 478 to AM4 measure this cooling unit and then we will be back. Both AM4 and socket 478 kind of have this rectangular shape for mounting mechanism but this one has a little bit smaller dimensions if we just fit this cooler on here you can see you put you can put it on but there's a difference right here between the mounting of the cooler and the mounting of the AM4 which means that I can basically just make a very simple adapter that can be attached to this block right here basically has this kind of shape and then be attached to AM4 I will quickly create that in CAD this is how my quick design looks like. The inner holes are for the connection to the cooler. Those ones right here, 
top and bottom and the outer ones are for the AM4 connection. It's a very very simple 2D shape which we can laser cut at Case King using the CO2 laser and just make it out of 10 millimeter acrylic. Should be able to do that within the next hour and then we'll be back. Our mounting adapters should almost be ready to go. The only thing I have to do right now is increasing the hole diameter with a drill to 4.5 millimeters so we can use M4 screws. The reason for that is that a CO2 laser or any kind of laser in general will not create 90 degree angles because you have this type of shape from your laser beam. Therefore, if you yeah, laser your hole, one side always has a bigger diameter than the, uh, the other side. That's normal, there's nothing you can do about that. But if you want to have uh, accurate holes, always just make them a little bit smaller, increase them with a the drill, much better. Especially if you want to cut uh, threads in them. For this purpose, it's not that much of a problem or not that important, but for especially cutting threads, you should always mechanically uh, work on them afterwards. Adapters are ready to go. The only thing we will have to change right now is the screws inside the cooler because those are not metric screws and the only thing I have are metric nuts. Therefore, we will have to replace those screws. It could be that we'll, we will have to change the diameter of the holes inside the copper base plate. Maybe we have to increase it to make sure the M4 screws fit through there. But otherwise, I think this should work quite nicely because we can already put it on here, right here and then with some other M4 screws make the connection to the motherboard. With a simple screwdriver, a little bit of gentle force, can remove the stock mounting and hopefully also reuse the springs for our new mounting kit. I just also noticed that the screws have to sit a little bit deeper inside the plastic right here. Those screws or those holes will be for the screw heads for the M4 mounting because if I attach those right now, I will not be able to reach them afterwards again. We're going to use the MSI X570 godlike motherboard in this video. Main reason, first of all, because it's very good for overclocking, has all the features we need and it doesn't have many components surrounding the socket, which is quite important for extreme overclocking. We have nothing that's in the way, so we should be able to fit on the foam stencil quite nicely and therefore protect the motherboard from any occurring condensation. Let's see if we can use this foam gasket to insulate the motherboard in addition. Um, we will remove the middle part and then I'm not going to glue it on because um, I think, because it could happen or it happened to me in the past, if this glue was too strong, then it could remove some of those very tiny SMDs that are still right here. We don't have too many of, on this board, but there's still some left and I don't want to damage it. I cut away a tiny bit here and here and now I think this is going to fit. Awesome. For the backplate I also increased the hole diameter on here to make sure it can still fit and spread the mounting pressure uh, on the whole PCB and not just the small points where the screws are. So far so good, fan is also attached to the 92mm noise blocker fan. The only thing we will still have to do is the electrical connection of the tech to the PSU. In the instructions from the original cooler, 
um, they just said you will probably buy your own external PSU for this tech but they never stated how much power this tech is drawing which is kind of risky if you would attach it to your PSU directly because back then in like 2000s the PSUs were not that strong you didn't have like your 1200 watts the sonic psu which is something we can easily use today that's why we can just connect it to power of the psu directly using some pci express cables i have spare for the sonic psus just cutting off the part that goes to your vga usually then connecting it to the tech and we should be ready ready to go System is up and running. So far I didn't connect the tech module just to make sure that we can first test the cooler itself, see if we maybe have a mounting issue. There could always be something in the way that CPU cooler doesn't make perfect contact uh, to the CPU itself. Looks quite nice. Let's check the temperature in idle. And the 3800X is currently running at something between 50 and 60 degrees Celsius, what I've seen so far. I think for 3800X that's uh, fairly reasonable and I think now it's time to connect the tech with the PSU and see how this changes. Time to plug in the cable, see how it goes. Current clamp shows about 14.5 to 15 amps which is about 170 watt power draw just from the tech. That's quite a lot. I would be okay with it if it was a water cooling unit, like a custom water cooling loop, but this tiny air cooler, I'm not so sure if this can really handle the heat. Let's see where the temperature ends up. Let's quickly see how the temperature acts if we run Silvench R20. I don't really have that much hope, to be honest. Temperature is not as bad as I expected, but yeah, mid to high 70s from the temperature is not great. It's certainly not great. You can see I transformed the cooler into a higher performing Ryzen box cooler. I'm actually not sure if it's higher performing, but it's higher power consumption for sure. I had to replace the noise blocker fan. Noise blocker is well known for having very low noise, but also not the highest RPM, therefore not the highest airflow. The Ryzen box cooler fan has higher RPM and therefore should be better performance. You can see we're in the low 40s right now with the CPU temperature with the tech switched off. Now we'll plug it in and see how it performs. Okay, we're finally below ambient temperature. We're not yet in the region where we could occur condensation. We're, ab about, we're at about 18 degrees Celsius while I have about 23 to 24, sometimes even 25 degrees Celsius in my room, mainly because of the many electrical items that are running right here in my room, many PCs and stuff. But yeah, at least below ambient. Turns out our threaded rod newly built AMD box cooler performs pretty much the same as the previous AMD box cooler where we ripped off the fan, except for that this one consumes about 170 watt of power, which is just too much considering that the temperatures were not great. In idle it was fun to see that it would drop below ambient, but it wouldn't drop below that we could really do anything with it. For really extreme overclocking you would need at least like minus 10, minus 20 degrees Celsius to really have a benefit of this type of cooling to see a benefit in clocks. But with this type of cooler, with this high power consumption and high temperature, obviously and unfortunately not possible. The power consumption of the tech is simply too high, therefore the temperature just skyrockets. It would need a lot more surface area to dissipate the heat of the cooling system. Thanks for joining in and see you next time.
adjust 